Great. All right. So we're two minutes after the hour here. So we're just going to go ahead and get started. My name is Amy Donahue. I'm the manager of communications for Pivot. And I'm just here to say a brief welcome and a couple of housekeeping items as we uh, kick off this second edition of our new weekly webinar series, Voices from the Field. Um, this is a virtual panel discussion. Um, we'll leave time at the end for a live Q&A. Uh, so we're excited to have you um, here with us this week and we hope you'll continue to join us. Um, the one request we'd like to make, if you can, is to shoot us an email uh, to let us know that you joined and also share any feedback or suggestions for topics you'd like to hear in the future. Um, the email address is info at pivotworks.org. So please, if you're in attendance today, we would love to hear from you um, so that we can know that you're interested in, in being a part of this. And with that, I will hand it over to our executive director, Tara Lloyd, to uh, say a little bit more. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to be um, with you again today, and we're so grateful for everyone joining us. Um, as you know, our subject today is Pivot Science and our latest initiatives to better understand and respond to the epidemic in settings like Madagascar, where we don't know as much as we wish we did, and Pivot's team is working hard to solve that problem. Um, just a couple of things to say before we get started um, in terms of um, framing. Um, First, we really want these to be conversations, um, not presentations. We've been talking about calling it lunch with pivot, except of course it's evening in Madagascar. Um, but either way, there's probably kids in the background for all of us and that's totally fine. These are really meant to be um, invitations to have a dialogue and that's a special opportunity for us. One of the sort of strange silver linings of this is how much more connected we're able to be remotely and, and for having our supporters connect with our team in the field. Um, every week we're going to have our country director, Laura Cordier, and our chief medical officer, Alicia Mayfield, join, regardless of what the subject is, because they both have really important perspectives, and when it comes time for Q&A, I want you to be able to talk to them directly. Um, right now, we uh, lost Laura's connection about two seconds ago, so uh, the internet is keeping us on our toes. When she rejoins, I'll have both she and Alicia wave hands to say hi. Um, Yesterday, or I'm sorry, last week I, I ran through a little bit of sort of the lingo of Pivot, and I'll do that one more time if we have new people um, on the line this week. Uh, Rana Mafana is the name of the town where Pivot is based, and it's also the name of the National Forest, which is closed now uh, because we need to make sure that the primates and the lemurs are being protected as well. But we will mention Rana Mafana, and we use that sort of interchangeably with the word Ifanadin, which is the name of the district and also the town center. Uh, the district has 214,000 people. It's 11 hours from the capital by road. And um, in the district where we are working to build a model health system with the government, there is one hospital, 20 health centers, and a network of community health workers that are really the backbone of what we do because 70% of people in Afanadine live greater than five kilometers from the road. So a three mile walk, not sorry, from the road from the health center. So a three mile walk um, is the norm if you're seeking care. Um, because we're a health system strengthening organization and a partner to the government, um, the COVID response like the epidemics that we faced together in the past, measles and plague are our core work. Um, that work has never felt more relevant um, to neighbors and friends than it does right now, I think. And we find ourselves in sort of a new moment in terms of the world's attention on um, health system strengthening work everywhere. So we're, we're grateful for that and we're trying to make the most of building that empathy and the connections across people in many different situations. I'll say to that extent that we want to take a special moment right now um, for our friends and supporters in New York State. Um, a lot of people who support Pivot are based out of New York, um, which is, as I'm sure everyone knows, experiencing an epidemic with COVID of proportions we couldn't have imagined. Um, our thoughts are with you as you build tent hospitals and, and look to get testing done as quickly as possible. More than a third of the cases in the US right now are in New York. Today in Madagascar, um, in terms of just framing where we stand, there are 50 cases reported, um, 5-0. So that's up from 46 just this morning. And um, we're beginning to see cases outside of the capital city, which is of course relevant as we do our preparedness work in Ifanadine. So our closest confirmed case right now is in a city called Fianaransu, which is about 90 minutes from Ifanadine. Um, so what that means on the ground for us um, is that at national level, we've loaned our ambulance 
um, one of our ambulances, and we're awaiting an international order of test kits and PPE, which we intend to share at the national level and also use to support the Fanadine response. Um, tomorrow, our office goes fully remote, which <laughs> across 181 people is a different challenge than it is in the US because of connectivity and people just not having a home office ready to go in most cases. Um, and then, of course, many of our staff are frontline health workers. So along with the government partners, those people um, have no such thing as a remote option. And, and our hearts and um, preparedness thoughts are with them as we make sure to keep them safe. Um, other things that I think it might just be interesting for you to hear me say aloud in terms of what it feels like to prepare for this um, in the Fanadine is that um, we're talking about secure water systems at the hospital and making sure that the supply there is reliable. Um, we have a worry about making sure that the people who ha hand launder the ambulance driver's uniforms stay safe. Um, community health workers, frontline responders getting enough PPE, whether or not we can build tents at the hospital ourselves, um, you know, along with the partners, but just whether we can import them or we'll have to build them. Um, one bit of good news that I thought you'd like to hear is that we have a, a physician who was supposed to start work on April 1st. Her name is Jessie. She's our newest international doctor, and she came early uh, to get in before the border closed, and her quarantine in Tana ends tomorrow. So as long as she passes COVID ne negative, she'll drive down to Ranamafana and join the team there tomorrow. So there's all sorts of special stories like that of people really going above and beyond, and those things are definitely keeping me afloat as long as uh, well as many of our teams. So. I'm gonna hand it over to Matt and the team now. Um, and in doing so, I just wanna say that one of the reasons I took this job uh, six and a half years ago was because um, I was really drawn to Pivot's um, commitment to data and research and science. The fact that we were starting work in a Fanadine district with a true baseline study run by Harvard and the Institute of Statistics and many of the people you'll meet today. That was unique in my career and it's been really important um, for the story we're, we're able to share at national level and the influence we're able to have internationally. Um, and I like knowing what we know and knowing what we don't know and using that as a guide to leading an organization that's dedicated to saving lives. Um, so as we watch the world learn a lot about what COVID is going to look like in the developed countries, um, it's really essential and life-saving that we do the fundamental research necessary now to understand what it's going to look like in places like Madagascar. So it's my honor and my, my privilege today to introduce um, my co-director, Matt, who's our scientific director and co-founder and the team that he leads to, to answer exactly that question on the ground. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> All right, so there are a lot of the participants I've looked at are pretty familiar um, and which is great. We want like this, as Tara mentioned, we want this to be a conversation and this is a kind of a, rap a rapidly evolving uh, situation. So, um, so the, the, like the outcome of this conversation can hopefully is useful feedback from, from you all and actually even from each other. <coughs> so, um, where I would start here is, um, is you know, for those of you who don't know, I'm, um, I'm trained as an infectious disease modeler, uh, formerly in an ecology department. Um, much of disease ecology is infectious disease modeling. Um, and also as an economist. Um, and when I see what's happening around the world right now, I think of it as not only um, a kind of health crisis and a kind of a political um, crisis of sorts in terms of uh, rapidly responding. I see it uh, in a supply chain crisis, um, but I see it in many ways as, a, as, a, as an information crisis. And I would say even stronger than that, I would call it a $10 trillion information crisis, which is to say that um, if we knew the, the moment the virus emerged, where it was, it could have been contained really quickly. Um, and then if we had good models um, that would project that and that they were reliable, um, then we could plan appropriately. And we're operating in this incredible space of uncertainty right now of the kind that has, uh, that given that uncertainty has like, has like basically put uh, the global economy in a coma of sorts. I've heard that language, not just a recession, but like an induced coma. Um, and that's, uh, that's all because uh, we, we don't always know <clears throat> who's infected, where they are, who's recovered, and um, and how to contain quickly. 
So um, <clears throat> the reason why I say it like that is because that's also those, those concepts of um, rapid information to be able to respond to individual, uh, to individual sick, in, sick individuals and set policies that work quickly, those are the big crises generally in global health. And they're the reason why Pivot was started. So Pivot um, is a non-governmental healthcare organization. Um, and our MO, one of our MOs is to help produce rapid information to help, the go help provide better care and help um, the government of Madagascar um, set better policies, inform their policies and help the global community. So, um, uh, so what that means is our research follows health care and the health system rather than the opposite. <clears throat> and so in this context, what that means, fortunately, is that we have um, particularly strong routine data systems that can be rapidly mobilized. <clears throat> and we also have this really amazing scientific team. Uh, it's both folks who work within Pivot who are, have some kind of direct support of Pivot and sort of, of a broader apparatus. Um, and then beyond that, um, I would say that we need to emphasize is um, the Fonadine District contains uh, a park, Ranam Fauna National Park, and in that park is our close collaborator, Center Val Bio, which is actually one of the main reasons we started in the Fonadine in the first place. And in that, at Center Val Bio is a is a biosafety level two infectious disease lab. And um, that scientific piece, uh, in addition to the overall data analytics and health system strengthening that we do, are actually the are fundamental reasons why we started. And there's, and, um, there's like, but there's never been an, an opportunity like this where uh, the world has mobilized around sort of what the specific questions are. And so it's kind of a unique chance for us as a group, as a larger group, which kind of works in different kinds of settings on different kinds of problems to get together um, uh, and, and mobilize around this response. <clears throat> so I wanna hand this over to the other panelists, um, but I'll just say that, um, that our main goals are, as, in terms of the research apparatus, are to, to be able to prepare uh, both within our district and nationally, to be able to respond really quickly um, and to be able to adjust policies based on what works and what doesn't work. And those things all require at their center, they need data we need, and we need analytics. And I'll just give one example of something that, um, that if this works, I'll be really happy. If it doesn't, it'll be fine. I'll see if I can screen share this. Um, that doesn't let me screen. But basically, I want to show an example of how we've done um, malaria modeling, real-time now casting of malaria that, that uses routine data collected out of facilities and projects the incidents that's happening across the district. And we want to do something similar to that. So not only forecasting, but rapid understanding of the distribution over time and space of, of, um, of, of, of COVID-19. So, um, so with that, I will introduce um, the next speaker. So we'll have Benedict, uh, talk, who's the head of monitoring and evaluation, talk about our data collection systems, both our existing routine data systems and, um, and how those are adapted for the COVID-19. We'll have Radu, uh, who's a research manager, talk about testing um, and our different ways that we're testing. Andre Skarka today will talk about how we'll analyze data and modeling. And Mark Krasnow, who's the chair of the board of Center Val Bio and a close collaborator, We'll talk about molecular elements of this and sort of um, and some of the issues around how what we can do in Madagascar can contribute to uh, the global fundamental understanding of COVID-19 in our response. So with that, I will hand it over to Benedict. Okay, uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, to start, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Benedict Razafundat. I come from Madagascar. Uh, I'm director of monitoring and evaluation and operation research at Pivot. I have been working with Pivot since 2014. So this year is my seventh year working with Pivot. So I have been invited to this webinar to talk more about the existing monitoring and evaluation system 
our collaboration with the Ministry of Health and our plan to strengthen the health information system and our vision for COVID-19 disease monitoring. So first, I will speak about the monitoring and evaluation system room. Uh, two years ago, we restructured our database so that all of the data is centralized in one place. This reconstruction allows us to have a front-end component with the development of visualization platform so that data can be easily accessed, viewed, and exported by project managers. We also move to mobile tech data collection for field teams. The goal is to optimize data entry. Concerning the data source for each project and program we support, we prioritize the use of Ministry of Health tools. Every month, we receive data from the ministry team at the district level based on the report shared by all the health structure in the district. In case our need for information is not met by the tools that already exist, we developed additional tools where we use the Google Toolbox application, Excel file, or papers. Uh, about the use of data. As we put a lot of effort into data collection, so we promote the use of the data as much as possible. Uh, PIVO has a data a dashboard to visualize our indicator, so the data is easily accessible for everybody. Currently, this platform contains no more than 700 indicators present in several forms where managers use them in their decision making in different reports as they submit to our donors or partners. The data are also used in more rigorous research conducted by the research team. And now I will talk about our collaboration with the Ministry of Health and our plan to strengthen the health information system in the district. So we work together with the Ministry's monitoring and evaluation officer at the district level. We are training to strengthen the health information system complement at each level. For example, at the community level, we train the community health worker on reporting and reporting keeping. And at the health center level, a supervision is carried out to ensure the quality of the data. And this year, our plan is to compare data collection at each level, like deployment of mobile technology at the community level, deployment of electronic monthly reporting at the basic health center level. And about COVID-19, the MNE team will implement two approaches. The first is to capture all that is checked in terms of changes in service utilization. And the second is case management related to case management as a follow up to suspect, confirm, and especially patient contact. The second approach is to support the ministry during the response of this disease on health information system. We plan to deploy a mobile application with common care platform based on the World Health Organization protocol. Our goal is to put a patient geolocal geolocation system in place to track patient and promote quality of care. And we are currently 
negotiating the use of this application with the ministry. So thank you for listening to me. Thanks, Benedict. So Benedict um, has been one of our has been one has been with us from the beginning. She actually replaced Lar Cody, who's our country director, uh, in her role as the head of uh, modern evaluation and understands our data systems better than just about anyone. So <clears throat> thank you. So next we'll um, hear from Radu. So uh, Benedict is about routine data collection. Radu will talk about the actual mechanics of how we actually test uh, or can test for for COVID nineteen. It comes from the Institute of Pasteur Madagascar, which has serves as uh, kind of the national lab for the gov for the for the nation of Madagascar. Radu, you're muted, but I'm sure you sound wonderful. Thank you, Matt. Hi, everyone. My name is Radu. My backgrounds are uh, immunology diagnostics and quantitative methods. I'm Pivot Research Manager and I've been working for uh, Pivot since uh, October of last year. So today I will talk with you about uh, COVID-19 testing. I think uh, everyone agree that testing for COVID-19 is crucial for several purposes, mainly for uh, diagnostic confirmation and for disease surveillance. Diagnostic results are useful for case, man case management, which means that uh, they are needed for identifying case as soon as possible, but also to understand the disease epidemiology, just to suppress its transmission. Uh, testing uh, options that currently exist are rapid diagnostic, diagnostic tests, molecular-based diagnostic and serological tests. Rapid diagnostic tests or RDTs have the advantage to be useful and practical at point of care. Since they are easy to do and have a shorter on time, probably need another confirmatory test. There are several uh, molecular based tests developed for uh, 2019 and COVID, which detect uh, viral nucleic acid, but uh, real time reverse, reverse transcription PCR is the gold standard. This technique multiplies the virus RNA and allow for detection and quantification of viral load. Many laboratories all around the world have developed RT-PCR assays, but part of the plan with trained personnel and uh, appropriate equipment Another recently developed molecular-based test, the Expert Express SARS-CoV-2, has the advantage that it could be done on GenExpert instruments. GenExpert machines are often used for the diagnosis of tuberculosis, and uh, we have one of these machines in the Ifan Medina District Hospital. Uh, this test can provide rapid uh, detection of SARS-CoV-2 in approximately 45 minutes with less than uh, one minute hand some time and it doesn't need a uh, nucleic acid extraction. The main downside of this test is that it's not yet available for purchase by countries like Madagascar. This is a new technology that was just released uh, last week. Serological assays, uh, mostly ELISA tests, still very useful for disease surveillance. These assays enable detection of antibodies against the virus, which appear a few days after patient was in contact to the pathogen. The differences in all of these tests uh, reside in their turnaround time their result interpretation and their current availability. 
with the current pandemic of COVID-19, we are exploring the possibility to set up diagnostic capacity at Central Valpior and Mafana for the Ivanatina district. For sure, setting up some of these uh, testing options in Ivanatina depends on the Malakasi Ministry of Public Health approval, as well as uh, ethical approval for uh, any specimen collection and testing for research purpose. And before I finish, I would like to share with you that based on my experience with uh, plague, out plague outbreak on 2017, I learned that disease surveillance is important during epidemics and the data that uh, we collect during this outbreak will be of great value for understanding how COVID-19 has affected Malagasy population. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Radu. <clears throat> so um, I, I wanna just say a, a few points about what that all means. So <clears throat> right now, Madagascar is further in the dark than even the US was you know, a month ago. And at, a, at the core, everything that we need to know um, is gonna be based on some combination of data being collected in the field surveillance and testing, and then understanding how uh, experiences have, have been, ha that have happened internationally, policies that are implemented, models that are working, uh, outcomes on patients and people, how that works in a place like Madagascar, which is some similarities with the rest of Af Africa, some similarities with the rest of, um, with parts of Southern Asia. And right now we're in the dark and um, it's a it's extremely critical moment, and all the challenges that we see in the U.S. with testing and the you not you name it the rapid detection tests, the reagents for supplies, the supply chain in general, those are challenges that we're navigating. Which is why um, Radu is explaining all these different um, strategies. So following him, um, we'll add. Um, actually, there's some Q and A. I'll I'll see. Uh, I'll read those while. Um, well, Andres is speaking, but so next is Andres. So Andres is um, also like Radu has a history at IPM. He currently uh, has a joint appointment at Institut Pasteur as well as IRD, the uh, French International um, Department for <laughs> Research and Development, um, and um, and he's been working with us for enough, quite a few years now as well. Andres. Hi. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yes, I'm Andres. Uh, I work as a researcher for IRD, French Research Institute, um, and I've been working also with Pivot since 2015, so almost five years now. And what I want to talk about a little bit more is I want to develop a bit further about what are the challenges and opportunities that we have in Madagascar in general, but also in Ipanadina in particular, for understanding the transmission and potential impact of an epidemic like coronavirus in a rural area of the developing world, which is something that, as Matt said, we're mostly blind about it. So, you know, there are several groups around the world that have been uh, working and developing uh, mathematical transmission models that, uh, you know, they're using so far data from China and developed countries in order to calibrate them. Um, these models are really important because they allow us to know, you know, what are the expected number of cases, the number, expected number of deaths, uh, what are the health needs uh, that we may need uh, in terms of resources. And so, uh, and also one of the things that they allow us to do is also to simulate different control measures and therefore what is the effect, potential effect that those could have. Uh, and so, many of the measures that are going on around the world, they're actually partly uh, because models predicted that they will be effective. Um, unfortunately, the problem that we have in places like Madagascar is that capacity for doing this kind of simulation modeling exercises is quite limited. So what we're trying to do at Pivot is to collaborate with research groups, both in France and the US, and to adapt existing models that we can hopefully use to provide estimates for the country of Madagascar and that hopefully will be able to guide uh, the government and its partners in terms of the efforts that they are doing. 
Um, there are several challenges for doing this. So the first challenge is that contexts uh, like Madagascar, but many other countries in, sub in Sub-Saharan Africa, is that they're really different from what we have seen so far. So in terms of age structure, in terms of comorbidities, in terms of malnutrition, contact rates, you name it. And so what we need to understand right now is whether these models can actually predict relatively well the dynamics that we're going to observe or they're really far off and we need to do major adaptations. Um, the second big challenge that we may have in places like Madagascar is the limited capacity that we have for testing, right? And so we have delayed and limited information for calibrating those models. So just as an example, in Western countries, we're currently doing thousands of tests every day. In Madagascar, the current capacity is 200 tests per day. And so you can imagine that under those circumstances, even if we do the best of the models, we will be working uh, with lots of uncertainty and we'll be forced to do a lot of assumptions. Um, and so thankfully, in the last few days, there are initiatives that are ongoing that are going to decentralize diagnostics. And also the diagnostic space is changing and evolving every day. And I think Mark will talk a little bit about it. And so we're hopeful that in the near future, this information will be available, but it, won't, it will likely not be available for the first, you know, for the early stages of the epidemic, which are critical actually. And so, you know, now the opportunity that we have at Pivot is that for the last five years, we have been building these great systems, uh, data systems, and also uh, feedback loops between research and implementation. Uh, and so this includes, for example, a longitudinal cohort study that is representative of the whole district. Uh, it includes a very exhaustive mapping exercise. It includes patient level data from uh, the health centers. And so with all of this information, we can know very well the demographic, the socioeconomic, the health and environmental conditions of every community in our district. Uh, and so, for example, we can adapt existing research that we have done, as Matt mentioned before, uh, in terms of geographic access to healthcare and using those in order to correct and provide more realistic estimates of what is the burden of disease and the incidence even in remote areas that, are, that have very low access to care. And so in the end, we'll kind of know uh, the true number of cases, more or less. Um, in addition to that, we're also trying to mobilize our network of collaborators, both nationally with Institute Pasteur, where I also have an appointment, and, and also internationally. So, uh, you know, folks like at Stanford, at Harvard, at the University of Georgia, and they are helping us uh, develop different aspects of our research protocols in which they have better expertise. And so together, one of the main things that we are hoping to do is to be able to start taking samples from suspected cases in Ifanadine under contacts from relatively early on in the epidemic so that we can calibrate those models uh, relatively well and therefore provide useful information for Pivot and for the government of Madagascar. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. So Andre said one thing that I think is like really important that we may not emphasize enough. Um, we operate at the entire health system. That's the district hospital, primary care centers, and community health. That's a really important function uh, in a situation like this where um, where uh, you, we will see delays, right? The, the places that we will first see um, uh, uh, um, uh, people testing positive are going to be out of coming out of the, the district hospital, and then hopefully over time, uh, we'll, we'll um, the data from the health centers and then ultimately the community will be really helpful. And it's very hard to seriously respond to a situation like this uh, without the at, without operating at those three levels. So that's like one of our unique <clears throat> roles. Another unique role is um, is uh, is is this connection with um, molecular lab capability. So with that, I'll, I'll um, turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Nat, and hello, everyone. 
I'm Mark Krasno. I'm a professor at Stanford University. Um, I'm an MD and a PhD, and I've been studying for uh, almost my entire career uh, the way that the body builds the lung, the way that it maintains the lung, and the way that it fights diseases uh, in, in the lung. And so uh, from the main research point of view of, of my laboratory, we are at the forefront of understanding how this new virus uh, uh, actually infects and alters the, the human lung and, and how the lung responds to that. Now, it's an amazing, this has been a, a, an amazing scientific event as well as, of course, uh, international crisis in that in the three months since the disease was identified, the virus has been identified, the human receptor that allows the virus to enter the cells, uh, human cells has been identified, uh, molecular diagnostics we've heard about have been developed in these three months, and we're beginning now to understand how the body responds and how it fails to respond in those cases where it progresses to respiratory demise. So here at Stanford, we're carrying on those, exactly those experiments where we have the virus, the purified coronavirus in hand, and we are testing the effects on human lungs and human lung cells uh, uh, as, as we speak to begin to understand at the cellular and molecular level how the body is responding. So this is an amazing uh, progress in the understanding that has led to the advances in diagnostic and hopefully soon therapeutics uh, and, and also, of course, vaccinations are, will be coming along. The thing that uh, attracted me and got me involved here with, uh, with, with, with Pivot uh, and with Central Valbio is we've been interested in the health uh, and the biology of lemurs in Madagascar, and that attracted us to Central Valbio, uh, where, of course, Pat Wright and her colleagues have been systematically studying the lemurs of the Ranamafan rainforest. But the thing that attracted me most to Centro Val Bio and Pivot was not only the systematic studies that Pat and her colleagues have been carrying out on these lemurs, but the new laboratory that had been uh, installed at Centro Val Bio so that uh, unlike anywhere in the world, not only could you study uh, lemur biology, sociology, conservation, ecology at the levels that Pat and her colleagues have been studying for decades, but you could also begin to understand the genes and the cells and the molecules that uh, underlie those, uh, uh, those uh, biological and, and, and health-related consequences and e ecological consequences for the lemurs. I've been talking then for a long time with Matt and with Pivot because it's that same systematic study of the surrounding villages and, and their health uh, that, has, uh, that, that has been Pivot's uh, uh, major way of exploring uh, uh, healthcare and healthcare delivery in this very challenging setting of rural resource challenge Madagascar. And now with this new disease where there has been this unprecedented international response at understanding the disease uh, at the genetic, cellular, and molecular level, and also understanding how communities respond and, and, and what types of responses work well, like in South Korea and Singapore. Now, a major remaining challenge that we're facing here with Pivot and in Madagascar is how does this affect, how does this new virus, this new disease affect the individuals and the communities in a resource challenged uh, uh, community like the communities around Ranamafan. This is, uh, I, I think, a, a huge unknown right now and a huge challenge. How do those individuals respond to the virus with the very different types of diseases uh, that they have previously experienced, their very different nutrition, their very different living style? Uh, uh, how, does, uh, how do the communities respond? Uh, and, and, and can we understand that at a level so that we have, in the best case scenario, something like Singapore or South Korea, where the disease is contained and controlled and the effects minimized, or uh, without that information and without the appropriate intervention, interventions, is it going to be something like New York City or Italy or, or worse? 
because as I'm very concerned about the comorbidities, the other diseases, and especially the lung diseases, like the, 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 the TB lung disease, uh, the, the, um, the, the COPD that most of the, uh, the villagers are, are suffering from because of living with the uh, cooking in their homes, is it gonna be even worse? And so without that information, uh, uh, basically how the disease is spreading and how individuals are responding in a community or village like Rana Mafan, we don't know if it's gonna be a South Korea type minimal impact or contained impact versus something that is more devastating than we've seen uh, anywhere else in the world. And so this opportunity that Pivot have and, and, and that we have as, as a group in, in Madagascar and especially around Afanadim district, where we have the ability to collect information that's been in place now for a, a number of years because of Pivot, and a laboratory facility that is a standard that is nowhere else in a community like that, that no other community like this has anywhere else in the world, can we put those resources together to make this a South Korea or Singapore-like response where it's contained, or is it gonna be something more devastating? And fortunately, uh, the D disease, uh, we're understanding the disease in the Western context at the cellular and molecular level and social levels, uh, and, and, and that the response and the movement to Madagascar is slower. And so we have a little bit of time now here, <laughs> not much, because as we just heard, it's already spread outside of Tana to uh, uh, just 90 minutes away from Ranamathan. If we act quickly, can we collect this information and mobilize the community to a response that would be uh, uh, like the, the best case scenario in the Western country and prevent it from being a, a, a catastrophic case, even worse than Italy or New, New York City? Thanks, Mark. Um, so from there, um, we, it's, there are a number of questions that are coming in. I think I wanna start with um, uh, Lila Purbe, if you don't mind. Um, Amy, if you could unlock her um, mute situation. Uh, and Alicia and uh, Laura are also going to turn their video back on, Matt. Right, exactly. And so, um, thanks. Um, Lila, are you still there? Can you ask, can you? Um, yes, I'm here. Can you, uh, can you, can you ask this question? Yeah, so I had three questions. One is how does the Madagascar preparedness, um, like how does it compare ca to other similar countries? Second question is how effective is the lockdown in your opinion uh, in reducing the spread of the virus? And the third is what's the maximum capacity of the healthcare system to take in patients at the moment in terms of ventilators, medical staff, and so on? Those are great questions because those are research questions and they're implementation questions and they're healthcare delivery questions. So I'll have um, <clears throat> Laura answer, answer the prep question and Alicia uh, answer the capacity question and I'll answer the, the, this lockdown question. The truth of the matter is we don't know how effective the lockdown will be in reducing the spread of the virus because we don't know how well um, the transmission of COVID-19 in developed countries translates to COVID-19 in, in Madagascar for all the reasons that Mark just said, comorbidities, transmission dynamics, et cetera. But we are gonna answer that, and that is gonna be like central. As this, as this epidemic is happening across, across the island, um, uh, and, and the response is like the, what we see in the US or in Europe or in Asia are, is similar to how Madagascar is trying to respond. Like we don't know our way out of this situation. It's gonna, uh, and, uh, and the first thing we need to know is understand how effective those are and then what our options are. So that's what my answer to that is. And that's exactly what we're gonna try to study. Um, so, Laura, do you want to say something about how Madagascar is prepared um, uh, compared to other countries? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, well, compared to other countries, it's uh, kind of hard to say. Um, a lot of it will link to the second question related to to the capacity of the healthcare system uh, in order to cope, especially with complicated uh, cases. Um, but the government of Madagascar, the Ministry of Health, I would say in the way that we're collaborating with them is definitely um, is in prep mode and has been in prep mode for a couple of weeks and is doing the best they can, uh, the best they can to prepare. And the focus right now has been on sensitization and you know, to the best of the country's ability, reducing movement, um, both internationally and locally. 
move forward with testing uh, as much as testing is available to the capacity of 200 a day. So I think um, considering the situation, there is, you know, with the number of cases, suspected cases and confirmed cases, um, right now the Madagascar, in my opinion, is doing the best that they can and has the ability to, to respond. Now the question is, if things ramp up, uh, as explained by Matt, and there's a lot of unknown there, we, you know, a lot more will have to be done and hopefully other organizations like Pivot will be able to support um, in order to make sure that the resources and the equipment is available. But right now, as explained by Tara, the biggest challenge in terms of preparedness is going to be the lack of equipment, uh, protective equipment, and also, um, uh, well, I'll let Alicia explain in terms of the more technical components for preparedness for complicated cases and case management. Can I, Matt, yeah. can I just can I say one thing? It's just that, Laura, we shouldn't say if it ramps up, we just we should say when it ramps up, <laughs> because it is coming. <laughs> there is not no, no right. stop. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so we have to be prepared now. Thanks. Alicia, yeah, you it's the optimist in me I'm trying to manage an organization of 180. <laughs> so, uh, as far as clinical preparedness, I mean, I think uh, on the positive side, the Ministry of Health uh, started thinking about this, uh, the possibility of an epidemic in Madagascar and started preparing for it very early on. Um, I have to admit, I'm a little bit ashamed that our clinical staff started emailing me about this, I think probably in January, definitely in February, and initially, you know, I think in January when we first started talking about it, I didn't think it was going to be an issue. At that point, it was really limited to one province in China, and um, but certainly rapidly over the subsequent weeks, it became evident that it, this was going to be an issue for Madagascar. And you know, so we've had the benefit of some lead time to prepare. Um, but as far as clinical capacity, you know, I think we're all aware of some of the limitations that the government faces. Um, there are pre-existing limitations in the number of healthcare workers. And as we've seen in the United States, this and Italy and Spain, other uh, developed countries who did not face pre-existing shortages of healthcare workers, we're really struggling here in developed countries right now. And so um, can only expect that this is going to be that much more challenging and a place that um, already had limitations in the number of trained and capacitated staff. Uh, so that's definitely a concern. And then uh, as far as higher level of care, you know, we are seeing up to 5% of patients in developed countries requiring intensive care. And that's, um, you know, things like mechanical ventilation that everyone's heard a lot about, as well as um, things you might not have heard about, uh, things called vasopressors that help keep the blood pressure stabilized. And, um, that level of care, and anyone else who may know otherwise can correct me if I'm wrong, but what I've been able to learn from our uh, clinical colleagues in Madagascar is those services are really primarily, primarily limited to the capital, Antananarivo, um, and even there in the capital are quite limited. So, you know, if as Mark alludes, we see a large rise in cases, which we can expect based on what's happening in other countries, um, it is my concern that those uh, facilities and that capacity will be rapidly overwhelmed. Um, and then there's the issue of all the people in other smaller cities or rural areas, um, what services can they uh, access? And we know that's already challenging. So, um, you know, as much as we can work together with the Ministry of Health to support them in this effort to increase um, different modes of oxygen delivery. There are multiple ways of providing additional ox oxygen support beyond mechanical ventilation um, that we're currently working um, with the district on and um, you know, can discuss at the national level as well. And I'll stop there. Uh, thanks, Alicia. Um, there's a lot of questions around the testing. <clears throat> um, I, uh, Zachary, Eric, um, 
on the line. I think that would be maybe you could communicate your questions around testing and um, and the clinical response. And this would probably go to Alicia and Radu if you're there. Zachary, I just gave you uh, talking permission. So if you just unmute yourself, you can go ahead and ask. Hi, I'm Zachary Rick. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, it's a great pleasure joining you and discuss uh, regarding what is going on really now regarding this uh, pandemic. So uh, as I asked you, my first question was uh, about knowing if you guys are able like, to confirm all suspected cases. By that question, I, I really want to know if uh, you have the capacity like to confirm the, the diagnosis for every cases or suspected cases, whether in Madagascar and especially in the district where you guys are working. And also, uh, or you will like try to focus on uh, epidemiologic uh, like data and the clinic symptoms are assigned to categorize the cases and to start treatment. Because um, I was like a couple of days ago, I was talking with um, some of my uh, previous colleagues in my country, Congo, which is also an African country and uh, in the similar like situation with Madagascar. And I, what I heard is that they are not like able to diagnose all the cases because they have like limited uh, resources. And I wanted to know if it's also the case in Madagascar. And uh, secondly, I wanted to know uh, which like therapeutic plan you guys has defined and you you will use uh, when you have like cases and when you will decide to treat those cases. So I mean uh, concretely, what like molecules you guys as defined to use to treat people. Thank you. Let me just summarize, Alicia. I think that what uh, the, the the spirit of some of these questions are: What is our testing strategy right now from a clinical perspective? How do we get what we want? Like, who, who are we testing? How do we respond to that? And then, and then the, the other spirit is, okay, where, which direction are we going? And there are some other questions related to the overall capacity at, uh, for molecular method, methods. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I could either give a really long answer to that or a really short. So I'm gonna go with really short, which is, um, we did, before there were known cases in Madagascar, we did expect that there would be an increased testing need. And so we did place an order for 7,000 tests um, even before there were known cases in Madagascar. Um, however, there have been some problems with those tests. Um, one type of test that we ordered uh, was since used in Spain and found uh, to not be as effective as we had expected. You know, all of these tests are very new and being rapidly kind of developed. And so uh, we're kind of just getting data uh, day by day on them. And then the other type of test that we ordered had, um, they're having some shipping issues. And so unfortunately, both of those orders have now been canceled and we are scrambling to try and put in additional orders. Um, the government of Madagascar obviously is working closely with the World Health Organization and um, other key partners on getting additional testing capacity. And what we're trying to do is work closely with them to support them. So as we're able to bring in rapid tests, we will um, certainly you know, follow the government's uh, directives on how those should be deployed. Um, but the, the short answer is at the moment, we're unable to do testing. And I will add, um regarding the flow of testing for now as it is implemented and um, effective in in our district um, the regions have now been deployed rapid tests antigen rapid testing if i uh, am correct and we are discussing with the region um, and the health the regional health officer um, what the what would happen in the scenario of a suspected case in our in our district and they said that the right now the rapid testing as it has been deployed is happening at the regional level if necessary so um, though it's not decentralized at a district level and the district of Ifanadin or pivot doesn't have the capacity for testing now if the cases occur we will have the support of the region to do so Yeah, and I'll add that like this is sort of the scenario that we're seeing all over the globe. Um, and 
the silver lining, if you can even call it that, I don't know if I would, is that there are so many different options that are being pursued. And so Radu mentioned the gene expert approach, which is we have a machine at the hospital. The government seems to be in going in the direction of um, more decentralization, uh, which is not traditionally the way that b big outbreaks are managed because of the national lab, the role of the national lab. But um, and so these th this combination of rapid detection tests, sort of like um, hospital-based capabilities, and then developing new um, um, molecular-based direct methods in the lab at Valbio are all options that we're pursuing based on their strategies. Does Radu want to add anything to? So these are like all, is a extremely burning issue, and that's what we're trying to resolve, like now. So um, does Radu or Mark want to add anything about the testing question? Well, I would I would want to say that. Oh, go ahead, Radu. What I uh, heard from the news is that even if there are a rapid diagnostic test, even there are uh, patient positive for RDTs, the results should be confirmed by uh, a real-time uh, RT-PCR uh, always at IPM in order to confirm the case. Mm -hmm. And the, and, the, and the other thing that I, I'd like to point out is that there are two general types of tests that are being developed. One are the ones that are current being used, which is to test, to identify the virion particles by identifying their ribonucleic acid, their genetic material. And the other types of tests are detecting the host, the human host response, their immune response to that. And so those, or tend to be that those types of tests show whether uh, uh, an individual has been infected with the virus. And that takes uh, 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 usually days or, or, or longer for the, for the host to respond. And so uh, they're less sensitive, especially in the early days of the infection, uh, which is the most critical part about when, when you want to contain the spread. Um. Uh, Emma, is Emma is Emma there? She has a question about the timeline. Emma, you can go um, ahead if you if you'd like to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm uh, based. I'm from Reef Doctor. I'm based on Team Andrefna. Um and obviously we're a long way from Tana, so we are limited. we I'm in a group with the the governor and the the governor's team. Uh, but there seems to be a, a lack of information and we are very much aware of the, the time limitation that we have, especially working in the rural communities in the north. And what are your suggestions of how long have we got until it actually gets to a point where we are going to be extremely limited with our resources? Okay, so there's, I'm going to frame that in two different ways. There's, there's what's going on with the, with the disease, and we have some insights into that, pro that process, that time process. And then there's uh, what's going on with the, the national response, and that's its own time frame. Um, I'll start with a response on the disease, and then maybe Laura can talk about the national response. So <clears throat> for being overwhelmed. So um, the models for COVID-19, the models themselves are pretty well developed for the, the models, the structure of the models. And um, they're, they're adapted from other, from other illnesses like influenza. And um, the big problem with all of those is the starting point. So I just heard a talk um, that was on the so webinar at Stanford from Lauren Myers, who, um, whose modeling showed that when, when China announced uh, 44 cases around January 22nd, I think this, these are the dates, that their modeling indicated given when the first infection was found in December, <clears throat> or must have emerged in December, that they made it, they probably had 11,000 cases in the province at that moment. So they're reporting 400, and there were um, about 400, and they, they're probably about 11,000. So, um, and, and all these, is, in every single one of these things, the, earl the earlier we respond, the better obviously. So it's not the case that we should win. <laughs> that like, so the, in the, the earlier respond, the more time we have to handle it. So that's, so, you know, um, we have 40, we have like, we're in the forties now in Madagascar and that's going to, that's going to grow uh, proportionally probably to the testing. But then in terms of the healthcare response, 
Laura, you, we, we're already seeing shortages of normal things, right? Do you want, do you want to respond to that? And Laura, I'll just say it's one o'clock, so we're going to lose people to the one hour mark, but we'd like to take your response and then close up. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, the, the timeline for Madagascar in terms of the, the health system, I think, again, I know, Mark, I'm being an optimist, but I think we'll just take it day by day. And um, the focus right now should be on making sure that health facilities are ready, that they're doing the best they can to triage. We know that the lack of protective equipment is a source of stress for people uh, and is going to, you know, impair this response overall. And, and, and we're all scrambling and trying really hard to, to support um, health practitioners in the front line. But um, it's, it's so hard for me to, I can't predict like what's going to happen, what's going to, when will the, the government or the health facilities be at a point where they can handle the way we're handling this as an organization is through scenarios. And I strongly suggest everybody who is working in different places in Madagascar or in other countries around the COVID response is because there is so much of the unknown. Yes, we're learning what's happening in other in other um countries and, and, and learning from that, especially in the modeling, but for now, there's not enough information to know exactly. And so set up different scenarios, understand what's going to happen when your utilization ramps up, whether it's um, external consultations at triage for critical care, non-critical care, and then try to infuse those inputs. How does this impact HR? How does it impact your medical logistics, the number of beds? your social support and we're just thinking about it that way and then making sure that we're able to support as we move from scenario a to b to c um all the time knowing that we don't know the timeline but being ready and supporting entities and the government to think you know when is it time to ramp up community health when do we start thinking about contact tracing and what does that effectively look like in madagascar so i would um you know, it's a lot of speculation, but it's being ready to be able to then have the right solution at the right time, all the time knowing the, 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 the situation that we're in that is not completely replicable of any other developed or other developing country as well, because the geographical barriers are massive here and, um, and it's very unique to Madagascar. So the response will have to be unique in Madagascar. And Emma, I'll, I'll wrap up. sharing our documents is helpful for you. We've, we're working with people in the partners in health space who have responded to Ebola and cholera, the earthquake in Haiti. So we have frames and documents we'd be happy to share. Matt. Why don't you wrap up, Tara? I'm kind of obsessed with time. Matt can see that all the way across the country, I'm getting anxious. Um, all right, I'd love to wrap up. I'd love to say thank you for joining us. As you can see, my strategy with Pivot is to hire highly competent optimists because it makes me feel better. Um, and I, I really do believe that this um, is a moment to be in it together um, in, in the space of solidarity with our neighbors um, next door and across the world. And um, for those of you who just gave us your lunch hour, I believe that you believe that too. So thank you. Um, we're going to keep these sessions going as long as we still have more people than ourselves listening. And so far we do. Um, so next week, I think we'll go towards the end of the week. We're trying not to, to choose a specific day because we don't want to rule out anybody who has a standing conflict and we might start moving the time of day around a little bit as well. We've got some colleagues in Australia that are feeling excluded. I'm sorry. Um, so we will um, announce the next time and topic um, in a couple of days here. And if you have ideas for that, if there are things that you'd really like to focus on, be it community health or a more particular clinical subject or um, back around to something general, please let us know. Um, and thanks again for all the many ways in which you are standing with us now. Bye. And one thing, we'll try to answer the questions that are here. Um, we'll just type them and do that offline. Thank you. Great. Amy? That's right. Thank you guys, everyone who joins. We will follow up with you by email. Um, and on that note, if you could shoot us an email to let us know you were here today to info at pivotworks.org, that'd be great. So we can keep you in the loop. And we appreciate having you all here and we look forward to See you next time. Thanks, Take everyone. Care out there. Bye. Wash your hands. Be grateful for the water you have to do that. <laughs> Bye.